or altars, which are scattered throughout Dinebata. Knowledge of these sacred sites are passed from generation to generation. Offering places take many different forms, such as rock formations, buttes, trees, springs, and others. Harriet Wilson of Tisto. The buttes have been here from the beginning, every one of them a sacred altar. The water, the natural spring, is a way of life as well as life itself. Our songs and prayers, our offerings, are our way of life. The United States was founded on the principle of religious freedom. However, the Diné people are being denied this basic human right. To forcibly remove the Diné people from this sacred land is to deny them the right to practice their religion, a right guaranteed by the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. You put me in your boarding school, make me learn your white man rule, be a fool. Oh, oh, oh. The Diné people are resisting this relocation plan. They have filed a lawsuit in the federal courts seeking the overturn of Public Law 93531. In preparation of the lawsuit, hundreds of meetings have been held throughout the joint use area. The Big Mountain Legal Office has translated and transcribed numerous interviews with traditional Diné elders, young people, and medicine people. These interviews detail the sacred bond between the Diné and this land. The resistance has undertaken this lawsuit in coordination with ongoing political and educational efforts. The time is now to act against this most blatant violation of basic human rights. This genocidal program must be stopped, and it is our responsibility as U.S. citizens. The sovereign Diné people of the Joint Use Area are resisting this so-called relocation plan. To the people, this plan is nothing more than another attempt to destroy them. Big Mountain Elder Nancy Walters. Judy the Nanny Lenny Gay Yahai Ado Lair Pikitchen has lost it in her nickel. As the people backed against the wall, we have nothing to re negotiate with because we are now down to nothing but our religion and our lives. To deny religious freedom for the Diné people is to render meaningless the words Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. On this, the 200th anniversary of the signing of the Constitution, are we as citizens going to idly stand by and watch its protections being stripped away one by one? Is the extinction of an entire culture the price to pay for the insatiable appetite of the multinational energy corporations and the technological future they represent. In our traditional tongue, we have no word for relocation. To relocate means to disappear and never be seen again. Well, Bill Miller, this is something that uh, everybody, I'm sure most people feel outraged about. Uh, it's kind of typical not only of the way which the white man in, the, in North America has treated the Indians and, or the Native Americans all these years, but also the just gross grabbing of their, of their land and insensitiveness to their culture 
is outrageous, but I guess this is nothing unusual, is it? Well, we, uh, you know, the Indians, we always hear the somewhat shibboleth that, that land is sacred to the Indians. But in fact, it really is. It's, it's more than just a saying. Uh, uh, the Navajo, for example, uh, when they have a, a birth of their child, they take the, the umbilical cord and actually plant it in, in the ground in their backyard. This ties them both literally and figuratively to the ground. And not only that, but, but of course the Navajo and the Hopi and most indigenous tribes uh, depend on the earth for their subsistence, whether it be through farming or through uh, uh, being a shepherd or something like this. So land is very much more sacred to, to the Indians than it is than it ever is to, uh, has been to the white men. We, of course, have nothing, no no comparable uh, cultural practices as, as the Indians do. I'm surprised that they, they base their opposition or base their legal uh, efforts against the U.S. government on religious grounds. I would think that uh, just the mere fact of forcibly relocating uh, around 15,000 people against their will would be against, uh, against the law. I mean, certainly it's considered against the law internationally, and the United States always wags its finger when they talk about the, the Soviets relocating Poles in Poland or the Germans relocating uh, populations. Or Why can't they attack this legally from that point of view? Well, because the, the United States Congress has first made the determination that that land is Hopi land. So uh, they're not really relocating someone off their, or their land. They're, they're assisting the Hopi Tribal Council in getting the trespassers off their land. Oh, well, even though people have intermarried and, and have been living together and among each other. Yeah, and again, it was, it was, it was completely a congressional uh, determination of what land belonged to which tribe. Hmm. And, it, and it really did not, as you point out, have anything to do with... Uh, uh, the current practices, per, uh, land use practices or, and cultural practices of the two tribes. Now this dispute's been going on for many years. Uh, we've done a pro couple of programs on alternative views going back as far as uh, oh, seven or eight years ago in which they were talking about this. Why is it still bubbling? Why hasn't it um, the, it been settled one way or the other? Well, the reason, a couple of reasons, but the main reason is that, that the Navajo simply refused to leave. <laughs> and, and the United States and the Hopi tribe are reluctant to use force to remove them. But the Navajos, there are at least 50 families of Navajos so that they will, they will not leave alive. And, uh, and that just would cause an escalation in violence that, that neither the United States government, the coal companies, or the Hopi tribe is, is ready to impose. What's the present status of it then? It's, uh, it's in terms of the relocation, it pretty much is in limbo. Uh, the Hopi tribe, at least the Hopi tribal council, has said that, that most recently that, that they really wouldn't mind uh, living with the, the Navajos who want to stay there. Uh, the FBI has said, well, we're not going to take anybody out by force. And the Navajos have responded uh, through the Big Mountain uh, Legal Offense Committee, uh, by, at least the, the Navajos that are living uh, on that land, by filing some lawsuits uh, which are challenging the, the government's right uh, and the Hopi's right to take them off the land in the first place under, as you indicated earlier, the, the, uh, the First Amendment, the free practice of their religion because they're saying that to be uh, relocated would so contravene their religious rights that uh, you know that that in itself is a violation of the Constitution of the United States. I don't recall too many cases in the past where the courts have honored this in the case of Indians though. What chances do they have? Well, I, I don't think that, that, that this has, has come to the courts recently, mm -hmm. and certainly the other decisions uh, probably, uh, well, I don't even, I, I suspect that, I don't know of, of any cases that, were, that have been brought uh, uh, making this claim. But in fact, uh, just recently in, in the Phoenix Federal District Court, uh, a, two different judges, one judge granted a temporary restra restraining order on, the, on one suit, which is the uh, Atakai versus the United States, uh, which asked to stop uh, current construction uh, and fence building in a particular area. And the one judge granted the temporary restraining order, and another judge granted a, a preliminary injunction uh, in the same suit. Now, the temporary restraining order was for 
14 days, 7 to 14 days, and now the preliminary injunction has been granted until there's a final hearing on it. But uh, you, you don't get a temporary restraining order signed or a preliminary injunction granted unless there's a reasonable, uh, very strong possibility that you are going to win on the merits. So uh, it, from that standpoint, it looks good, but that is just limited to construction and the fence building in this particular, in this particular area. Now, the whole relocation issue is, is, uh, is, a, uh, is being determined by the United States, or the many beads versus the United States suits, which was originally filed in Washington, D.C., and uh, I believe the government has filed a motion to consolidate those two suits and bring them back to Phoenix. So uh, that's, uh, that's the current mm -hmm. status of that. But again, I would think that, uh, that there is a, a a reasonably good chance, anyway, that the United States court system would deal fairly and equitably with the tribal claims. And as you point out, it would be one of the first times. There seems to me something else that's uh, outrageous, and it seems to me to be illegal, and that's the fact that the families who do relocate into a town or something like that and find that they can't, the culture shock is too great, they don't like living there, they will let them go back and live in their original homes. They will not. Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, it's like, you know, if I say, well, I want to leave Austin, I'm going to go live in Dallas for a while, and then I don't like Dallas, and somebody says, hey, you can't go back to Austin. That's correct. <laughs> that's outrageous. How come that's legal? Well, again, that's the, that's the provisions in the law, and, and what's even more absurd is the congressional the, the congressional law that was passed regarding this whole thing? Yes, uh, oh. 531, uh, which is even more absurd is to assume somebody who is all their life lived on the basis of caring for 20 sheep are going to be able to go down to a, in, to, to a suburb in Flagstaff where they can't have any sheep at all and, and live happily. Uh, they have, they're simply not equipped. And of course, uh, you know that there is no training, uh, no. no cultural training, no any sorts of training that would uh, help these people make that transition period. And a lot of them don't even speak English, I'm sure. That's true. Especially, especially, uh, and, and the worst part is the, the more traditional Navajos. In other words, the, the, the Navajos that are more tied to the land, that are more tied to the old ways, <laughs> do not speak English. And therefore, they would be the ones who are, are much more deeply affected by this than the, than the younger and the modern uh, Navajos. Wow. Well, this is just another chapter in the outrageous history of the way we've treated the American uh, Native Americans all these years. And uh, it's a, going to be a continuing thing. So if new, anything new pops up on it, we'll let us know and come back and report to the people on alternative views. I'll be happy to. Thank you, Bill Miller. Thank you, Frank. I see we have time for a couple of more news stories before the end of the program today. As President Reagan was on the telephone expressing his concern for the three ice-bound gray whales that were the media sensation of October of 1988, at this very time plans were underway to begin the administration approved slaughter of over 600 fin and minka whales under the auspices of, quote-unquote, scientific whaling. Yes, Ronald Reagan has signed a bilateral agreement with Norway, Iceland, and Japan that will allow these countries to kill whales in order to undertake certain unspecified scientific research. According to David Phillips, who's the director of the Earth Island Institute, that this attitude of Reagan's to express concern over three whales trapped in Alaska while the TV cameras are rolling, but allowing over 600 whales to be hunted down and brutally slaughtered while nobody's watching is simply symptomatic of the hypocrisy of the Reagan administration that Reagan himself has perfected to such a uh, art. At the same time that the media was making all this uh, fuss about these uh, three uh, whales that were captured or that were trapped in the uh, ice, they were completely neglecting the slaughter of the dolphins that has been taking place over the last uh, few years. In 1972, responding to public indignation over the killing of uh, dolphins, Congress passed the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which was a landmark act of legislation aimed at protecting not only dolphins but other marine animals like whales as well. Since its passage, however, more than a million dolphins have been slaughtered by the U.S. tuna industry under congressional legislation that has weakened the intent of this original act that allows the uh, tuna companies 
to uh, slaughter a dolphin at the same time that they are catching um, uh, tuna. This has reached uh, such an extent that the same groups that in the late 60s and early 70s began a boycott of the uh, tuna companies because they were killing off the uh, dolphins and using dolphin meat in the uh, tuna oh, have God. called for a renewed uh, boycotts, in particular of Ralston Perina that uh, makes uh, chicken of the sea uh, tuna, uh, the Heinz Company, and then uh, Bumblebee uh, tuna. These are the uh, tuna companies that have led the way in the slaughter of the uh, dolphins that various uh, environmental and animal protection groups have called for a boycott of. Well, we all hear about the war on drugs and don't say no. However, the Surgeon General says there's a drug which is killing 300,000 people per year. And that's good old tobacco. He says that the addiction to nicotine is no different than a drug abuser's addiction to heroin or cocaine or alcohol. As a matter of fact, he said that cigarettes are up to eight times more addictive than alcohol. So what does the U.S. government does? Well, it says, just say no. You know, we have all these advertisements on just say no. Now, they don't say a thing about cigarettes, though. $331 million each year is poured by the federal government into treatment of alcohol and drug abuse, which is over 25 times the amount estimated of $12 million for smoking cessation. And then the flip side of this is that the government gives uh, the tobacco grower subsidies of over $270 million. At least that's what it was back in 1986. Now, even though $4 billion in Medicare and Medicaid bills are due to smoking-related illnesses, well, what's the medical establishment doing about it? Not a heck of a lot, uh, according to uh, this report, which is... Hmm, the Health Letter, the Public Citizen Health Research Group of November 1988, says that even doctors and hospitals have refused to smoke, to uh, focus on the smoking epidemic. And a recent survey revealing that over one half of all smokers were not even advised by their physicians to quit smoking. So, however, it also says that uh, the consensus is clear that there are certain ways that are very tried and true that can be used so that people can kick the habit of nicotine. Well, who's to blame? According to the newsletter, the neglect lies in many laps. The government's caved into the tobacco industry. Medical schools don't train physicians in methods of smoking cessation. Physicians really don't know very much about these effective techniques, but they're, they, when they do use them, they're, it helps their patients to quit. Hospitals treat tobacco-caused illnesses, but they do little to help people give up on cigarettes. <laughs> so... It's a lot more fun to just say no to crack and heroin, but not to the big killer, tobacco. Hmm. That brings us to the end of another Alternative Views. We're glad that we could share it with you. We'd like to thank Wendy Nine, who made all the arrangements for bringing the material which we showed you tonight regarding the Native Americans. And we'd like to thank Brian Lynch, our director. We're appreciative of the people who are involved in the production of the slideshow in defense of sacred lands. The production editors, Corey Dubin and Zach Singer. Narration by El Chao Cunha. And the flute music by R. Carlos Nakai. Additionally, Floyd Westerman was involved in the production, as well as the other America's radio, located in Santa Barbara. And finally, K&L Custom Photographics. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Goodbye.